to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Apostle Paul said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Acts chapter 23, verse number 1. We welcome you to our study of the book of Acts, and we hope you'll get your Bible and stay tuned as we study this wonderful text together. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. In this text, Acts chapter 23 through 25, the Apostle Paul is now going to be giving a defense of the gospel and of Jesus Christ before the Jews and before the leaders of that day. And as he begins this great sermon, this great message in Acts 23, Paul looks intently, the Bible says, at the council and he says, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. We think about Paul's words here and there is a very valuable point to be learned and it's this. Paul identifies and addresses the fact that conscience is not a safe guide in religion. You know, often the statement is, let your conscience be your guide. But friend, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that if it feels right, or if we think it's right, or if that's the way we've been trained and we respond that way, that that necessarily means it's right. The Bible teaches that our conscience must not be over or more important than the Word of God. In fact, what is a conscience? Well, a conscience is just an echo of knowledge that a person provides for themselves. A conscience can be either good or bad, depending upon how that person's conscience is trained. Now, let me illustrate. Paul again said, I've lived in all good conscience before God. Now, notice this, until this day. Now, what does that mean? Notice this. Paul said, right up to this moment in time, I've done everything right that I felt was right based on conscience. Paul, does that mean that in Acts chapter 7, when you were holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen, you thought that was right? Yep. Acts chapter 8, when you were wreaking havoc on the church, did your conscience tell you that was right? You bet. In Acts chapter 9, when you were headed with official letters from the synagogue to drag Christians to prison, did you feel, did your conscience tell you that was right? Absolutely. What do we learn from that then? Paul realized conscience was not a safe guide. Just because one thinks it's right, or feels it's right, or has been trained that something is right, does not necessarily mean that is right. How can we know what's right and what's wrong? 
Listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 32. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. My friend, it is truth that is far more important and far more consequential than one's conscience. Should our conscience be trained by the truth? Absolutely. But just because I feel something's right or I think something's right doesn't necessarily make that right. When the Bible says it's right, then we can know for sure that's the way God wants us to live. And so as we think about practical application, here are some areas of application to this text. First, let's realize that our conscience cannot be our guide as it comes to worship. There are a lot of people who no doubt may have a a warm, fuzzy feeling for God, no doubt want to maybe worship God in a heartfelt way, But does that coincide with the teaching of the Scriptures? Their conscience says to worship God doing one thing, but is that according to what the Bible says? Too many times we let our uh, emotions run before truth when it comes to worship. Let me illustrate. Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse number 24, God is a spirit. And those who worship Him, listen now, must worship in spirit and in truth. There's no doubt that our worship needs to be heartfelt, needs to be full of emotion and and thanksgiving and praise to God. But what is that which leads our emotion down the right path to worship? Spirit and truth. We have the spirit. We have man's emotion, desire, doing things a heartfelt way. But it must be guided and governed by the truth. Again, we ask the question that Pilate asked. What is truth? John chapter 18, verse number 36. And of course, Jesus addressed that clearly in John 17, 17, when Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. All of God's commandments are righteous. Psalm 119, verse 172, the Holy Spirit has guided men into all truth today in the pages of the Bible. John 16, verse 13, and Peter said, we now have everything for life and godliness. Second Peter 1, verse 3. And so as we think about the conscience as it relates to worship, let's realize our conscience must be guided by the truth. Somebody says, well, this feels good, or, or I think this is right in worship. Friend, that won't cut it. Paul said, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Did that mean because Paul felt or thought it was right, that the holding of the coats of those who stoned Stephen, the wreaking havoc on the church, and the dragging men and women into prison is actually right? Well, no, it was dead wrong. But just because Paul felt it was right, didn't make it right. A second area in which we also need to not let our conscience be our guide is when we're making certain judgments on things. Now, friend, there's no doubt Christians have to judge between right and wrong. John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus said or commanded even, judge with a righteous judgment. Well, how do you make righteous judgment? Just judging off of conscience alone may not necessarily be a righteous judgment. A righteous judgment is when it's right because God has said it's right. Now, I know sometimes people will say the Bible says do not judge, and they'll quote Matthew chapter 7 and talk about that. But, friend, the kind of judging going on there was hypocritical judging. They went halfway around the world to make a proselyte, made him twice as much the son of hell as themselves. Jesus commanded us to judge. With righteous judgment, John 7, 24, not on feeling alone, not on conscience alone, but based on the truth of God's word. God's the final judge. He's already given us his will. God's already made the decision on what's right and what's wrong, what's morally acceptable and what's not. And therefore, let's not say, well, I think or I feel or this seems rather Let's let the Bible be the answer. God has given to us all things for life and godliness. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. We must study to show ourselves approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. And the scripture is indeed our guide. We're not to add to nor take away. But when we stand behind the word of God and we say something because the Bible says, we say the Bible says this is morally right or morally wrong, then, friend, we're not stating our opinion or our feeling or what our conscience necessarily thinks. We're stating what the Bible says 
is right or wrong. Then there's a third area that we need to be careful in letting our conscience be our guide, and that is in areas of salvation. I hear a lot of people say, well, I say, well, how do you know you're saved? And they say, well, I feel it. I just feel that I'm saved. Well, this is the way we've always done it, and I know that's got to be right. Uh, This is the way my mom and dad did it, and I know that's... Wait a minute now. We can't let our conscience be our guide in matters of salvation. We've got to, again, trust what the Word of God says. There are a host of people teaching a multiplicity of plans of salvation who all think and feel that they're right. Does that mean they're all right? Only those who follow the Bible are going to be saved. And thus, we can't let our conscience be our guide as it relates to salvation. Now, let me give you a couple of illustrations. Some will say, well, I know I'm saved and I feel I'm saved because I said the sinner's prayer and I know that's what I needed to do. Well, friend, where's the sinner's prayer at in the Bible? You can search the Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. And you won't find the sinner's prayer as many are saying it today. Well, I feel that's right. Feeling alone is not a safe guide. When it comes to salvation, some will say, well, as a baby, I was sprinkled and I know, I feel that's what God wanted me to do. How do you know you were? Somebody had to tell you. You don't remember it. And can you find that in the scripture? We don't find babies being sprinkled and saved in the scripture. God gives us a clear plan of salvation, and only when I've done what first century Christians did can I know I'm saved. Let me illustrate. They heard the word of God. Acts chapter 2 verse 36, Peter proclaimed, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly God's made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They heard that message. That message was based on the truth of Scripture, and they made a commitment to believe that. They said in verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart, ready to change their lives and make a commitment. And Peter said in Acts 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. So someone says, Well, I believed in Jesus and I feel that's right. Friend, let's base our salvation on something more substantial and solid than that, the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, Hebrews eleven six. 6. If I base my faith and my salvation off what the Bible says, then, friend, that's not near as subjective as what one's conscience feels or thinks or suspects is right. And so there is a place for conscience, no doubt, if it's trained by the Word of God. But let's not let conscience get out in the front. Conscience is not the leader. Truth's the leader, and our conscience follows in line behind that. And that's really the biblical way in which we ought to think about these type of things. As we then further look at Paul's message in Acts chapter 23, we now learn another very powerful lesson, and that is, as Paul is speaking about this, some uh, negative things, some persecution is going to happen, and Paul realizes, hey, we've got to leave vengeance to God and let God deal with the wrongs. Look at Acts 23, verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Well, how did Paul respond? Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Here Paul faces some pretty severe persecution. High priest reaches out and and lays one on Paul, smacks him good, you know, hits him. How does Paul respond to that? Did Paul get up and get angry and fight back? Paul said, God's going to take care of you. You're nothing more than a whitewashed wall. Beautiful, ornate on the outside, but Jesus would say, inwardly, you're full of dead men's bones. Now, the practical lesson is this. In life, there may be things that happen to me and you negatively. There may be persecution, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. There may be difficulties that arise from standing up for truth, whether it be not being socially accepted, losing friends, having bodily harm done, whatever it may be. There may be things that happen to me and you. But let's remember Romans 12, verse 19. God says, Vengeance is mine. 
I will repay, says the Lord. My part, my responsibility is not to rise up and take matters into my own hands and reap vengeance right back on people. No, the Bible says we're to do good unto all men. The Bible says that we're to do good and to reap coals of fire upon their head in the book of Proverbs and in the book of 1 Peter. And so, as a Christian, I want to follow in God's teaching and let God be the one to issue vengeance. And I just want to live according to the way God wants me to live in this life. Now, another unique thing is going to happen in Acts chapter 23, and that is we learn a powerful lesson about not making promises that you can't keep. Look at Acts chapter 23, beginning in verse number 12. The Bible says, And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now you therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him, but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Now, Paul's life's in jeopardy. These people have a plot and a conspiracy. Hey, you tell him you're going to come down and question him. Along the way, we're going to ambush and kill Paul. We're not eating or drinking till we do. Well, Paul's cousin, Paul's nephew rather, found out this was going to happen. He went and told the commander they didn't allow that to happen. But what about all these people who made that oath? We promise. But until this happens, we're neither going to eat or drink. Well, I kind of doubt they kept that oath because they wouldn't have lived if they had. But you know what? We need to really be serious about making promises that we can't keep. And friend, especially, especially making the promises that we do to God. When I made a commitment to become a Christian, I made a commitment to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, verse 4. I made a commitment to follow the example of Jesus, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. I made a commitment to try to reach the lost with the gospel. And every day, I need to live up to that commitment and that promise that I made to God. These people here are left with egg on their face. They can't fulfill that promise. They've done it in front of everybody. Now they're the, the shame and the mockery of the people. Well, friend, let's make sure that we live up to the promises and the things that God wants us to do in this life. You know, there is another important principle to be learned from this same context, though. As we mentioned, a young man in Paul's family actually saves the day here. I want you to watch what happens in Acts 23, verses 16 through 18. The Bible says, So when Paul's sister's son, his nephew, heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him, brought him to the commander, and said, Paul the prisoner called, uh, called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. And so it goes on to tell what's going to happen. They defeat this plot and this ambush. And as a result, this young lad, this nephew of Paul's, actually saves the day. Friend, what practical lessons do we learn from this? Look at what good this young man did for the kingdom of God and the cause of Christ. Let's realize that young people can do good things in the Lord's church. Timothy was a young man, and Paul said, be an example to the believers. Uh, Titus was a young evangelist, and he did great good in preaching the gospel. This man did good, and throughout, throughout time and centuries, we've seen that young people are important to God, and just because, Paul said, let no one despise your youth. First Timothy 4.12, we need to realize that age doesn't keep us from being powerful and important in the kingdom of God if we're willing to follow the teachings of our God. Then we move into Acts chapter 24 as Paul continues his journey that will ultimately lead to Caesar and to Rome itself. He's now going to be brought before a very powerful and in many ways immoral leader. And that is the governor Felix. Felix wants to hear Paul. He has some inkling of an idea about Christ and Christianity and he wants to, he's curious to know more about that. And Paul really puts him on the spot with three points in a major sermon he preaches. Look at Acts 24, verse number 25. The scripture records Paul before Felix saying, 
Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a more convenient season or time, I will call upon you. Why did Felix get afraid when he heard that? Well, listen to what he reasoned about again. Righteousness which Felix, by all accounts of history, was not a righteous, but rather a immoral man. He should have been righteous. He knew he should have been, but he was a rather immoral man, involved in debauchery and immorality and, and carousing and revelry. Uh, righteousness, self-control. The people of that day, especially in political leaders, were not known for their self-control, as is sometimes the case today. And then this last point, judgment to come. We've got to live right, Paul says. You've got to control your actions and say no to yourself, and you've got to do all that in view of the judgment. How did Felix respond? He was afraid. He was was brought to terror. A shudder came upon him. And he said, go away for now. I've got a more convenient time. I'll call upon you. You know, this is one of the sad statements of the Bible. I don't know if that time ever came for Felix. I know he was trying to get around having to face some very difficult things. But I wonder how many people have said this same thing, if not publicly, to themselves. The gospel is preached. They know that to be truth. It pricks their heart. They, they, they hear the invitation given, and they know they need to respond, and they respond by saying, when I've got a more convenient time, I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'll do it when I get my life right. I'll do it when I get X, Y, and Z fixed. Friend, the Bible word is not tomorrow or more convenient time. The Bible word is now. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Listen very carefully. You will never have a more convenient time to obey the gospel than right now. Here's why. This is all we're promised. What is your life? It's but a vapor. Here for a little while. Then it vanishes away. James 4, verse 14. If I say, I'll, I'll, I'll do it when I get a more convenient, when everything's in line, when I can work it out better, what if that day never comes? We know this. It's appointed a man wants to die and then the judgment. Felix should have responded in fear by obeying the gospel and changing his life. But he didn't. What about you? And what about me? Is that convenient time upon us now? And what are we going to do with that? We can say, I'll do it tomorrow. We don't know if tomorrow's going to come. We need to obey now what we know now so that we can make sure that we're right with God. Then turning our attention to Acts chapter 25, Paul is still going to be having to face some of these leaders. He's eventually going to go before Agrippa and others of the day, ultimately to Caesar and all the way to Rome itself. But before he does that, he's going to be told there's going to be persecution coming. Paul doesn't fear that because he doesn't object to dying. If I've got to die for the Lord, Paul says, so be it. Watch Acts chapter 25, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verse number 11. Paul says this, For I am an offender, or if I'm an offender, or I've, I've committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying, but if there's nothing in these things which the men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them, I appeal to Caesar. And so here Paul says, you know, they've prophesied bad things are going to happen. It looks like, Paul, that you're going to be bound and put in prison. You might even die. And Paul says, wait a minute, if I've done something worthy of dying, I don't object to dying. Paul wasn't afraid to give up his life, even if it meant going all the way to Caesar itself. Paul did not value his life more than he did his service to God. Listen to what Paul said in Philippians chapter 1. Verses 19 through 21, Paul said, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why did Paul not object to dying? Here's why. Paul had already died. I've been crucified with Christ, he said. No longer is it I who live, Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, follow up that idea with the words of Acts 25, verse number 12. Listen to this. Paul says, then Festus, or the Bible says, then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. This is one of the 
the monumental points in Paul's evangelistic journeys. And I want you to think about this. Paul has made his appeal as a Roman citizen, which was every citizen's right, to appeal to the highest judge of that day, Caesar himself. And so I want you to think about this. God made it a mission. He plainly stated Paul was going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Now think about this. Rome is going to pay Paul to take the gospel to Rome and to Caesar itself. Now you think about the providence of that. Paul is going to take the gospel to Rome. We read about that in the book of Romans. And he's going to take the gospel, no doubt, to Caesar as well. And who's going to foot the bill? The Roman government is. Can't you see the the providence and the power of God in all of that? I appeal to Caesar. Paul had already made his case before God and changed his life. He wasn't afraid to go before Caesar himself, even as a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, friend, as you think about Acts 23, Acts 24, and Acts 25, there is an overriding theme that we must be committed to, the teaching and the power of the gospel over conscience, over what governmental leaders may say, and over even when our life is put on the line. Today we ask you, have you obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Friend, there is no more convenient time than right now don't put off till tomorrow what you know you need to do today have you heard the message about christ faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of god romans 10 17 do you believe that to be true according to the teaching of the bible jesus said unless you believe that i'm he you'll surely die in your sins john 8 verse 24 are you willing to change your life And really repent. Luke 13, 3. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men? Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. And would you do what the Lord said in John 3, verse 5? Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Would you be baptized? for the remission of your sins and make a commitment to walk in newness of life and live faithful to Jesus Christ every day. Our hope and our prayer for you is that you'll do just that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.